Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. I'm Harknell. And you do awesome.org. <laughs> <laughs> We're listening to Otaku Generation. Holy crap. What's Reesh? What's Bank? Well, you know who to thank. It's Ellen and the boys. So let's all make some noise. The Yak King never gets old. It rocks me to my gut hole. They bring all the otaku to the yard. Otaku generation, they rock hard. Otaku generation show. Otaku generation show. Otaku generation show. Otaku generation show. Welcome to show 867. Hi, hello, everyone. I am Alan. I am Matt. And I am Paul. What's Freesh? What's Bang? What's Squeak with the OG crew? All right, so we're going to do our best to keep things short on the front side of everything. Uh, so what did I do? Two things of note. I started watching uh, the book of Boba Fett. Uh, so I like it. It's good. And then uh, I also watch the uh, Eternals movie. It's on Disney+. Plus. So uh, those are two things that I did. Matt, what about you? Uh, let's see. Probably the only thing that I did recently that was like fandom interesting was uh, I finally got around to watching the, the entirety of Rick and Morty Season 5, mm. uh, which is out on home video now. I'd previously been sort of catching bits and pieces of it on television and now i was able to to sit down and just like watch everything complete and uninterrupted and i, I enjoyed it a lot cool so is that the most recent season i believe so yeah i think uh season six is uh currently in production and has not aired yet and how do you think this one holds up? I think I watched the first half when it was airing and was getting pretty fed up with it. And I meant to get back to finish it up, but I just didn't. Mm, it seemed to me like they were more on target than uh, than season four was. Um, season four was was good, but it just didn't seem like it was was as focused as as they could have been. And I think in this one, they they sort of got back to doing weird stuff with Rick and Morty, but also doing stuff, doing the weird stuff in a way that was also kind of a commentary on the weird stuff, which I think was where Rick and Morty really hits their best stride is mm, where they're, yeah. they're not just having goofy sci-fi adventures. They're also doing things in a way that, that comments kind of on the science fiction tropes that, that they're playing around with. So that was my impression of it. I don't know if, if you, uh, if you felt the same way after watching it. Yeah, I need to get back to it. It's been a while. Actually, I, for all I know, maybe it was the first half of season four I watched. I've been away from it for a bit. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it felt like it was kind of wearing out the novelty and it was just sort of going through the paces. So so if, it's, if it picks up on sort of the science fiction side of things instead of just kind of uh, everybody's a jerk and we're going to <laughs> do some rather weak improvisation um you know that's that's when it's not at its strongest but if they're but you know when it when that show is on it can be really really good mm. um so anyway that's about all i've been doing um how about you paul <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it's not been a very fandom heavy week for me either, uh, mostly because I've been trying to get ahead in watching uh, the current uh, season of anime shows, which has been a right. supremely unrewarding process, <laughs> as we will uh, be discussing in, in fairly short order here. Um, Oh, I guess uh, Bryce and I finished up playing through Halo Reach, uh, mm -hmm. which neither of us had played before. And it was a perfectly adequate uh, shooter. 
Um, it's sort of, uh, it's, uh, it was released as a prequel to the Halo series, uh, storied, uh, one of the biggest Xbox 360 franchises. I, I and, believe I've heard of it. Yes, indeed. Uh, and it's, so it's, it sort of is, it's the Rogue One of Halo. Okay. So you, you play the team that gets everything into place that gets Cortana to the pillar of autumn just, uh, before Halo one starts. Uh, and okay. uh, but everybody dies horribly at the end. Um, and I wasn't super impressed with it as a shooter. I mean, it was perfectly adequate, but it was more. Um, I mean, there's not really many mechanics to it. Um, so, but it was it was good. Glad we played through it. We're going to be uh, moving on to a new game I picked up. I think I mentioned it last week: The Ascent, which is the uh, sort of twin stick cyberpunk thing. Okay. So I've, I, I'm save, I started that, but I've been saving it till Bryce and I can tackle it co-op. And I guess the only other thing to mention is uh, just before this, I was uh, playing my, uh, my weekly um, game of, uh, of Genesis uh, RPG <laughs> set in the salvage junk punk universe. And it uh, continues to be really rewarding. So I'm uh, currently finally deciding on what the next campaign I'm going to be spinning up this year is, uh, which is going to be something fantasy. Uh, but I've been trying to decide on the system. and I've been doing a bunch of one shots. So hopefully uh, a couple of people who've expressed interest will be getting contacted uh, as I start to get this nailed down. And maybe we look at trying to get something on the schedule. Okay. But other than that, uh, not too much for me. Okay. Uh, John and I recorded a Polymatic. I don't know when that will come out, but maybe this month. Um, that being said, let's uh, let's rush over to our seasonal reviews for Yay. this week. So we got another seven that, uh, that we, we watched. Uh, so what's the first one, and um, what do we need to know? Where shall we start? Okay, the first thing up on our 2022 Winter Impressions Part 2 is Akebi-chan no Sailor Fuku, or Akebi's Sailor Uniform. And it's basically about this girl who lives in the countryside and is getting ready to enter middle school, um, which is a big deal for her because living in the countryside, she's been sort of doing the one-room schoolhouse um education up until this point and she's the only girl at her actual age level so she's really happy to be going off to a proper middle school with city kids where she will have more than one person in her class and she will da, 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 get to wear the traditional sailor school uniform um the seifuku and the whole episode is about her looking forward to this and um, going to the store with her mom to pick out materials and her mom sewing it and her going off to her first day of school. Um, and that's, that's all that really happens in this. This is not really a show where things happen or there's conflict. Um, everybody in this show is uh, blandly pleasant, enthusiastic and sincere um you know a, a kebby is is nice um and it's it's mostly sort of about managing hopes and expectations and disappointments and nervousness and uh a lot of virtuous uh stuff like that well i wish that's what this show were about uh, okay, but for, before we get to that, first, um, this show is excessively well animated. <laughs> I mean, excessively. It's like a weirdly show offy. Uh, we are just going to animate the shit out of this. Eat, 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 eat it, Kyoani, Kyo right? Uh, I mean, just these lush backgrounds. I mean, there's a bit at the start where KB turns a, a, uh, like a, a cartwheel. And yeah. like every frame of her body motion is animated. Uh, it, largely the directorial angles for the shots as things are put together, the way it cuts is just brilliant. And then there's all this careful, lovingly detailed animation 
of middle school girls' feet. <laughs> and, and like just the astonishingly beautiful gobsmacking quality of this animation makes this um, sort of not quite deniable fetish material all the more squickier. Mm. Um, so That's true. I, I noticed that, but I forgot about it until you mm. mentioned it. Well, because the show looks so good. It's like, are they really doing that? And, and yes, they are really doing that. They spend, <laughs> and, and like if they were just spending the the too long focusing on like uh, KB's uh, thighs or, you know, these apparently innocent sequences of her naturally getting dressed as she puts on the uniform her mother's made, you know, you could almost do it. But then like that first shot where she's stretching the toes of her feet and it's this POV shot of her feet, it's like... That that ain't right. Something something is just wrong there. That is not a shot that you put in a show for any wholesome reason. <laughs> now now so so I mean I, I, unfortunately that like ruins everything about this show to me. And like there's one other thing. So so mm -hmm. like the characters mm -hmm. are all they all like have exactly the same smile. Like eighty percent of the time, all the characters have like this gentle, empty-headed smile. Every wow. single one of them, it's exactly the same smile. And, and as you're like looking at these these uh, sort of empty expressions, and the facial expressions do not measure up to the rest of the animation. This show, there mm. is just something about these the, the 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 view that looks like squished. Like when I was watching this show, I kept saying, "Wait, is the aspect ratio?" right on this is is something fucked up um <laughs> but no there's like the characters heads are just too too vertically short and hmm. it, it, i don't know it's just it's weirdly off-putting it's a very deliberate choice about the character design but it just threw me off constantly um but and but you know that in its own wouldn't have been enough but i gotta say the thing with the feet combined with the um you know there's just that sort of the unwholesome shots of you know of that that are trying to say so hard oh look how arty we're being <laughs> so so sadly um you know this this show is it's just creepily off for me and mm. from that description you probably know if you are going to like it if you could ignore the feet thing but other than that uh i i, I can't watch this one oh okay i was uh i was just going to say it was like bland and wholesome but uh but you remind me of a lot of stuff that i sort of glossed over <laughs> while viewing it if paul's description makes you interested for some reason uh oglink.com slash six two two all right, so next up is Q, uh, C-U-E with an exclamation point. And it's about mm. um, a bunch of young teenage girls who want to become voice actresses. And they're, they're all showing up for their, for their first meeting at uh, the, the voice actress agency, which is so brand new that the first girl who gets there has to help them unpack the boxes. And basically it's another one of these like, you know, idle, idle generation shows where you've got all these young girls who, who want to make it in show business. Um, and the show business in this case is, is not being an idol star or working in a maid cafe. It's being a teenage voice actress. And, uh, and that's sort of basically what it's about. All of these girls are, young and earnest and they all have distinct character designs and alleged personalities and not much devoted to characterization everyone gets like one or two lines to establish their personality trait and then we move on to the to the quote unquote plot of the episode which is that a surprise audition is sprung on them and they have to uh get up there and voice act very earnestly because voice acting is serious business. Yes. 
And they are, in fact, uh, reading from Hamlet, which most of them do not know. And so as they, you know, read with various levels of competence from Hamlet, the other girls comment about how 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 amazing it is that when people say things with their voices, you can make pictures in your mind. Uh, yes, everyone is is uniformly well received and everyone is just gosh, wow, how wonderful everyone is, um, which doesn't really say much to me except that the the theme of this is not um interpersonal cattiness and mean girl hijinks it's about you know actually climbing the the rungs of the ladder of success and giving it your all and uh in true japanese spirit you know never say die I, well, okay, so my, my take is that this show is actually about, who golly, there are a fucking lot of girls in this show. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are so many that they started to run out of ideas for the characters and had to, like, start repeating them and giving them the same shtick. So um, they now they do have mostly visual visually distinct costume designs. You know, those costume designs don't change for the show, right? So they're actually exactly the same from all the angles. But the visual designs do have a nice diversity to them. Um, but like, there's just too freaking many people in this show. And so like when the girls have to introduce those spells, they spend like over five minutes with each girl saying those, you know, those two lines and like making the little pose that shows you that they have, a, they, yes, really golly, actually have a personality. Mm -hmm. uh, the gimmick is this is a new agency. They only take on girls with no history of voice acting. And you will not be at all surprised to see here that this is a gotcha game adaptation. So, you know, inspired by this game, you too can collect all the voice actress girls, but not the cool ones who you'll have to uh, re re redeem a hell of a lot of money for. <laughs> is, is that the way the game plays? Uh, yes. Yeah, typically the gotcha games are like loot box sort of things. Uh, or so I am led to believe because I do not play them. But apparently uh -huh. uh, there's, there's, there's an anime slack I'm on where people do play them with great glee and application. And they're very excited about getting, you know, whatever the, the random delivery box is. Actually, um, in, in Odd Taxi, the show we watched recently, there's a mm -hmm. character who gets addicted to a gotcha game uh, where you have some sort of virtual pets and like the super rare ones you just have to keep spending money and money and money in order to finally get that random roll that you want oh yeah and uh and he comes to a bad end because he he basically you know gets obsessed about getting some specific creature in this game he's playing and it just never comes up it just never comes up even though randomly it should have come up but it never does and it, it just drives him over the brink of madness. So, um, so, so the, the gotcha name comes from the um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the toy vending machines, like the little capsule machines. Mm -hmm. uh, you, yeah. you put money in, you turn a lever, a little capsule drops out, and there's a random toy in it. Yay! So. Uh, so it is, you'd think it would be uh, from Gotcha because it, it they're, you know, certainly, uh, you know, getting you for all the money they can, um, <laughs> uh, they can squeeze uh, mostly out of the whales, uh, which are is the term for these people who just spend, you know, insane amounts of money on this. Uh, but oh, yeah. no. But gasha 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 is is the sound it makes when you turn the crank on the machine, and so uh... so. Yeah. So anyway, that is far more interesting than this show, which is not interesting. <laughs> it is just a, a bog standard idol show. To making these characters be uh, in, in not very competent voice actresses does not change that dynamic at all. All righty. Alan, what did you think of this show? I think that Air Blue is stuck in my head now and that I don't like that. And so, therefore, I'm going to give you oglink.com slash 623. I, I wouldn't watch this. All right. Well, that one didn't work out so well, but maybe this next show, which is also adapted from a video game, will be the sterling highlight of this season's anime. And that is... Girls Frontline, or Dolls Frontline, as the on-screen title lists it. Um, and it's 
basically that show for everyone who's been waiting for teenage Lolita robot girl soldiers. This is your show. Um, that's that's right. In the grim dankness of the future, <laughs> there are only girl robots named after guns. And to keep things clear, all these girls carry the same types of guns. Okay, okay. I, I got to say, that's a lie. It isn't quite true. There are also other kinds of girl robots who've got guns under their skirts, and they lift up their skirts, and then they can do infinite machine gun fire at these old model girl rob robots who only have like AR-15s and so on. Yeah, um, basically, the, uh, the gimmick is that there are several different factions in the wake of World War III. Um, who have these little, you know, squads of robot, teenage robot girl soldiers running around in basically Lolita cosplay outfits with their, with their guns, performing various missions. Um, and our protagonist team is, uh, is from the, the Griffin faction, and they're going to steal some extremely sensitive data from an archaic computer that is being controlled by the Sangvis faction. And basically the only difference between them that I can tell is that the Sangvis faction, their foot troops are girls in black bathing suits and the officers have like big long flouncy Lolita dresses Whereas the Griffin team has sort of quasi Napoleonic outfits for their ground troops and their main characters have, I don't know, sort of militaristic flouncy dresses. Uh, and it's, it's just basically a tactical encounter between these two teams where the Griffin girls have to sneak into this abandoned outpost and hack an archaic computer system and copy some data, which apparently is so classified that even the Sangvis team doesn't know about it. So they have to courier the data out of the battle zone and get it back to base because if they transmit it over the air, then the enemy will intercept it. And apparently, even though it's from an enemy system, they don't know what it is. Uh, so, so they can't transmit it and then they have to fight their way out. Uh, that that's about it but it, this is one of those shows where they try and play it realistic but then they totally undercut the realism with with all variety of of just silly nonsense like the uh like as as paul mentioned the the sangvis like elite troops have these big flouncy lolita dresses and they flip up their skirts and they've got a quartet of basically infinite supply of ammo machine guns under their dresses to the point where they're able to fire their all four of these machine guns continuously for like five straight minutes tracer rounds every every round and never run out of ammo and yet somehow never manage to hit anything either and with all that which sounds like it could be like kind of wacky it is completely po-faced. I mean, this show does not want to have any fun at all with this concept. Uh, the girls are miserable. They're dying. They're barely managing to eke out an existence in this, you know, this post-apocalyptic uh, world. And it's just, it's just, it is pretty grim, actually. Although they do have high tempo rock music when they start firing the machine guns. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this, so, this one really is, didn't work for me. I mean, unless you like the anthropomorphic guns thing, I <laughs> can't really see there's, there's, there's much here for anyone. Yeah. Um, and the, one of the things that just annoyed me when I was watching this was um, the, the whole gimmick of, of this particular MacGuffin is that um, the Sangvis who own the computer system that this data is hidden on don't know how to crack it so they need the enemy force to compromise their own computer system 
and extract the data so they can then defeat them in battle and capture the data. And they make this horrible tactical blunder of basically announcing that that's what the situation is to the Griffin girls before they have successfully extracted the data. And I'm just looking at this going, well, that was a very um, anime villain thing to do, <laughs> but you couldn't have waited like five minutes until they had successfully extracted the data for you and then left the building, which was providing them shelter from your like army of swimsuit clothed robot girls before you attacked them. It's like you couldn't just wait until they closed the door behind them and then, you know, mowed down everyone but the robot who had the data and accepted her surrender. It's like, no, we're going to start firing on the building where a numerically small elite force is able to take cover and fire back and, in fact, sneak two people out of the battle area to get reinforcements. It's like, bye. <laughs> so. Yep, and then at the end, um, the girls are just saying, "If only, if only we had someone to give us weak will, weak willed girl robots orders." <laughs> and you, the viewer, are saying, "Oh, me, me, please let me give you orders." But, but no, there is a a competent blonde woman who shows up at the station saying, "Well, let's see what fresh meat we've got here. We can put to work kill another girl robots." So, yeah. So that's the show. That's the concept. Yeah. The uh, orders concept. I would give Bad you show. would be to not watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for some reason they're called tea dolls, and oh, I can't hmm. think of any reason why they would be called tea dolls in particular, um, unless maybe they're trying to make an allusion to Terminators. And all I can think is like, oh, I've seen Terminators. You girls, you ain't no Terminators. No. <laughs> um, but if for some reason you feel compelled to watch the show, you can oglink.com slash 624. Okay. So next up, a little turn towards the, com the comedic with Kaijin Kaihatsubu no Kurotsu-san or Miss Kuroitsu from the Monster Development Department. And this is one of those shows which is kind of based on the, the silly idea that there is a, a secret conspiracy that is taking over the world, um, but they're taking over Japan first, and they're taking over their local prefecture of Japan first first. And this is that organization. It's, it's kind of like Akros from Excel Saga or the, the phone pole team from Prefectural Earth Defense Force. Um, so it's, it's a combination of, you know, crypto conspiracy taking over the world things with their monsters and just ridiculously pathetic, underfunded, um, ad hoc, uh, villainy. Um, so the basic premise is the secret evil world domination organization, Agistia is headed by basically, a I want to say like a 12 year old blonde girl, um, but she nevertheless commands a prefecture wide secret organization composed of villainous human beings and horrible looking monsters, as well as the beleaguered scientific bureaucrats who actually produce all of their technology. And that's where Miss Kuro Itsu comes in. She is a junior development scientist in the monster development bureau and today she has been tasked with going up against the Agastia's council of evil with a monster proposal which her asshole 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 of a chief scientist boss has cobbled together at literally the last minute with no actual monster development behind it and that's basically the the plot of this episode um poor poor miss uh, junior scientist is up against the council of evil desperately trying to pass off this 
incredibly lame and ill-prepared monster concept as the next greatest thing to defeat their their prefectural enemy um oh what's his name the divine swordsman (laughs) Um, divine swordsman blader Mm, uh, who has you know heroically been thwarting all of their previous monsters and they've got to convince you know all of these you know very mean looking um basically five-man team villains that that you know they're they're going to kill divine swordsman blader with with this latest monster concept and they're all just yawning and sort of scowling irritatedly at her as she is desperately trying to project confidence and enthusiasm uh in in the face of disinterest and scorn when apparently what she has been given to work with is an old guy in a Loch Ness monster uh mascot uniform (laughs) so so yeah so what we have here it's it's basically a workplace comedy of sorts and i mean there's there's more or less three jokes in this show i like like one of them is what if a corporation but they make monsters Right. Uh, the second joke is, what if an evil organization, but the boss actually cares about the employees rather than murdering them? And and then the third is, of course, we're kind of incompetent. Uh, yes. Everyone is overworked, understaffed, um, underfunded, and working for a, a malign organization of evil, which, despite that, has actually good management metrics at a certain level. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so, so I mean, this had some okay moments in it. I mean, this wasn't the worst thing we watched this uh, this this season. Um, I, I mean, it wasn't. I would say funny exactly, um, <laughs> but it wasn't terrible to watch. I mean, like the the second part is they make a Wolfman monster brain and they put it into a girl's body because the um, uh, the, the the chief executive of the evil organization thinks it would be easier, and then they just get you have zero sympathy for this uh, this you know poor monster uh, and the resulting general gender dysphoria they're experiencing. Yeah. It's like you, well, you create this like fearsome wolf monster, and because the boss is a twelve-year-old girl, she demands that the monster be cute. And they're like, "What?" And it's like, "I want it to be cute, more feminine." And they're just like, "Oh God!" So they have to pull mm-hmm. an all-nighter at the last minute and make the the giant menacing wolf humanoid into a cute teenage girl wolf mm-hmm. humanoid, um, which in a way kind of works out well because um divine swordsman blader is you know a young man who doesn't have that much experience with members of the opposite sex and you know when she's bouncing around and her uniform falls off as of course it does he is temporarily incapacitated by an embarrassing nosebleed um, at the sight of a cute naked girl which allows them to uh sort of declare half a victory and withdraw from the field of battle before the wolf bet gets killed so so really (laughs) what what this show so while watching this show most of the time i just wished i were watching excel saga because while this (laughs) show is fine like excel saga manages to be over the top and hilarious and nonstop. and this one is just eh, it's okay i mean you know it's kind of kind of amusing i guess yeah, yeah, my, my it, first thought was discount Pokemon, um, <laughs> and then I it just it, it sort of reeked of trying to do something that was like other things. Um, but that being said, it wasn't the most painful thing we watched uh, oh, even this my episode. No. Oh my no! So in that regard, eh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, victory. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I would watch it. I wouldn't know that I would spend more time with it. But if you do want to, oglink.com slash 625. Okay. Uh, next up is, yes. Oh, 
definitely something now, is next up. Yeah, um, I would, I would, I would say just save yourself the headache. <laughs> and I can just give you the OG link now. We can just move on. Not well animated, kind of painful to watch. Oh. Even the, the stuff at the end, the live action, whatever the hell that was. No. So the title painful. is uh, "Sabi Iro No Armor Reme" or "Rusted Armors." And, and uh, you're really just trying got, to torture people. Now, uh, my, my review of this one is mostly swearing, frankly, and it's mostly swearing because I had to watch it. Like I mean, this is this is the show this season that I had to watch in five minute chunks because I couldn't take it in more than that. Yeah, the the high concept of this is it's set in the Warring States period of Japanese history, but we have sort of fantasy samurai firearms battles. Um, because there's this tiny village of super duper gunsmiths who somehow tap into some balonium natural energy, which gives them superhuman fortitude, as well as the ability to custom make super duper firearms and swords and things, which makes them invincible. Uh, and makes their village invincible, which means, of course, that every feudal lord in a hundred miles is bound and determined to conquer them, to gain the secret of their power. And as lame and awful as the premise is, it is just completely blown away by the utter incompetence of the production as the animators prod these twitching, badly rigged 3D models about bland forest sets as these male idol voice actors chatter inanely in ways that are utterly disconnected with anything happening on the screen. Um, and, yeah, and the, the the animation here is is very very obviously 3D animation, maybe with a cell shader, and right. It's uh, there are it's, video it's games not, that are it's, are better animated. It's it's not <laughs> good, sirs. It's yeah. it's not good. So 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 I was right before watching this, I was playing uh, God of War, which just got a PC release. Oh yeah. And, this game is fucking fantastic and you've got like this um uh you know this this you know stern angry emotionless protagonist except he isn't emotionless he's filled with rage but he's also trying to be a good father and so like <laughs> his Every sort of motion, you know, and the pauses evoke so much about this character and both the ways he's competent and cares and incompetent. And, you know, and, and the thing is, he doesn't bob about, right? The characters animated in this show are always engaged in all these unnecessary motions as they sway and twitch like a bad v tuber idol animation i mm. mean video games have gone so far beyond the level of this show even shitty video games right the, i mean this is incompetence on a deep and fundamental level for the creators here so yeah um, all I'll say is if you really want to watch this train wreck you can oglink.com/626 um, is this actually on a streaming service? It is not. Uh, that's the other red flag, right? Two red flags. <laughs> yeah. Video games. Most video games are better animated. Yep. And it, it, no one's picked this up as far as I can tell. Mm. So this goes uh, to an A and N link. All right. Uh, so next up is Shikakuman no Saikyo Kenja, or the strongest sage with the weakest crest, which is given the long title, not surprisingly adapted from a light novel series. Mm. And this oh. is your, your pretty oh. typical swords and sorcery kind of world. And uh, the basic idea is that our protagonist is a super duper powerful 12 um, year old who is headed off to the Royal Academy of Swords and Sorcery um, to get some like official rank and training for his magical abilities and uh, also uh, to redeem the reputation of his low-ranked magical crest. Uh, the way magic users work in this world is you're sort of born with a crest on your hand, which is like a sigil, and 
this allows you to summon and control magical energies and of the four known styles of crest this guy has got uh the lowest ranked one and uh but of course it's secretly the most powerful one and he's out to you know prove his his might and defeat the demons that are infesting the royal court and uh generally kick ass and take names and uh do cool stuff for your entertainment yeah so it turns out that apparently he's the reincarnation of a super powerful musician uh, excuse me magician uh, and so he's got all the memories and all the powers and you know so he's got everything that he's like well why does everybody think that the best magic is the worst magic uh and and so the way problem solving works in this show is he shows up in a place and everybody says oh my god you are amazing so he shows up in uh in, in a in blacksmith and some girls are there and the blacksmith is being a jerk and he says oh i can fix it and everyone's like oh you're amazing and then he goes to school and beats everybody in the competition and the teachers are like oh you're amazing please teach us your amazing <laughs> magic but we can't teach it at the school because we have to beat the number one school who says we can only teach the worst magic so they go and yes he beats them all and it turns out they're demons who are convincing everybody the best magic is the worst magic and man i find I hate this show. I was gonna say, Paul, you seem to really love this show. <laughs> oh, oh, oh it, dear you know, it's, God, it's, I was it's just so seething amazing. all the way through this. Okay, I, okay, I'll, I'll say this. Okay, here is my praise for this show. At least it isn't an isekai. <laughs> well, it is kind of an isekai because this guy is a reincarnation, so he's. Uh, but it's in the same world. It's not another world. It's, you know, okay, and, okay. And, and, and there's no actual MMO mechanics, right? It's got a stupid mechanical magic system, but nobody's pulling up like a uh, a game interface to invoke their spells, at least. That's so. true. At least it is it is diegetic to the actual universe. So well, there is that. It doesn't qualify as an isekai, but it does qualify hey. as something we watched. Uh, so that being said, oglink.com slash 627. I wouldn't recommend you watch it either. <laughs> All right. And our seventh and final uh, anime for this episode is Sonno Bisk Doll wa Koewuro Suru, literally the Bisk Doll that fell in love, English retitle, My Dress Up Darling. Uh, adapted from a manga, it's about a boy from a family that makes um, Hina dolls. Um, those uh, the sort of creepy geisha and samurai lord dolls um, that have like porcelain faces, I believe. Yep, quite right. Um, but anyway, it's uh, traditional Japanese art, and his family makes them, and at a very young age, um, he just became enamored of them. And even now that he's a, a teenager in high school, he is so totally focused on um, the art and craft of making these Hina dolls that, that he has no friends at school, and he's just totally introverted and focused on making the costumes and painting the faces for these, uh, for these constructions. Um, that it just seems like he's going to die alone and unloved with nothing else to his life, but he and dolls um, until he meets a girl. Uh, who just uh, falls on his desk. <laughs> and nearly as concusses if, herself. Yes. As if from the heavens, but does not actually fall in his lap, does not expose her, um, her, her panties or anything. No, she actually just like almost seriously injures herself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but nevertheless, this is sort of a social entree as far as these shows go. And when she stumbles across him uh, using the high school's uh, sewing machine in a club room, after school because there is not currently a sewing club in force um it turns out that she is also sneaking into the club room to do a bit of sewing because um despite being pretty and popular and fashionable and you know well liked by everyone she meets she is enamored of cosplay mm -hmm. and she's a, a a nerdy geek and she wants to make a cosplay costume except that she really does not have uh, the sewing skills required 
uh, for even basic sewing, let alone the fairly elaborate um, craftsmanship that goes into a good cosplay outfit. Um, and so uh, she has a need, he has a skill, and they sort of become unlikely friends, and he agrees to um, use his doll costuming skills to help her make a human-sized cosplay costume. And, th- and that's sort of the basis for their, mm. their relationship. So I, I give it give it points for being about sort of cosplay, right? That's something new. I don't think we really have seen a show that has a focus like that. But mm-hmm. I immediately kind of take most of that credit away because the characters, the teenagers are so vapid. And that <laughs> kind of just on its premise bothered the crap out of me. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I, I'd say that uh, they have personalities, right? So these are individual characters. Um, they're not sort of the generic types we see in a lot of these other shows. Uh, so, for example, um, the the main girl, I can't remember what her name is at the moment, uh, but but she, for example, isn't like secret a uh, secret otaku, and this is going to be her in with the otaku main character. Mm. Right. So her thing is much more, you know, you should not make fun of people for liking the things they like, whatever they are. And so she likes that. And that's going to be that. And there's like an uncomfortable moment there when she like reveals her her cosplay garment to the male protagonist. And he just like rips it apart, just like total cruel saying this is utterly incompetent crap sewing and she's well, just like basically utterly he, crushed he is he is critiquing it from a professional level uh, and when when he gets to the end of it he realizes oh wait she's not doing this because she's trying to demonstrate sewing mastery she's just doing this because she really wants to do the cosplay and mm. and he kind of realizes that he's being too harsh and and he in fact apologizes mm. to her. Yeah. So I mean, from from my perspective, this is I think the most promising show of the season so far. I mean, of mm. the uh, fourteen that we've talked about, uh, this I think is the one that has the the best chance of actually being a good show. Um, so I've uh, heard uh, someone who's a big fan of the anime comment on, or of, of the excuse me, of the manga, uh, say that this is not in fact a harem. So it's much more about the relationship between these two characters, which is also a big plus. Uh, you can't necessarily hey. tell that from the uh, extremely sexy opening credits uh, where the main character appears to be dancing with a lot of different girls um, uh, in different cosplay outfits. But apparently they may be all the same girl, uh, but we'll see. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't take this and I actually kind of enjoyed it. I mean, I think this one's got some got some potential. Yeah, mm. uh, even though I, you know, I had some harsh critique about it, um, I, I thought this was the the least worst offender of of the group that we've watched <laughs> yeah. so far. Um, I don't think it's a topic area that I would spend a lot of time on, so it's certainly not something that I would watch. Um, but I I wouldn't be against recommending it to others. Mm. Yeah, I'd uh, I'd be curious to to hear the opinion of somebody who actually does cosplay or is sort of like a fan of cosplay um, as this show goes on to uh, to like send us some feedback about, you know, how true it rings to, to your experience doing cosplay. Um, uh, so I, I will comment that the, that my wife uh, sews and oh. the sewing sequence in the uh, opening credits is fantastic, right? There's a lot of detail going on there. Mm-hmm. And also his commentary about what's wrong with her, 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 uh, <laughs> her outfit garment is in fact, extremely technically on point, not just uh, made up <laughs> from scratch. So, so I'll, I, I think from like a technical perspective, uh, there might be a lot to do here. So uh, I, I wish that, you know, at least at this first it were a little more balanced and it were not that she's going to transform his life as he dresses her up Mm -hmm. and this were a little closer to to, uh what was it smile down the runway Mm -hmm. um where you had two relatively well balanced protagonists with different but uh, but goals that kind of 
brought them together and brought them in the same direction. Now, maybe it'll get there. This one is much more, I think, intended to be a romance with, you know, cool cosplay uh, theme going on. And, okay. you know, I could be down for that. All right. All right. Sounds well, interesting. If you are interested, uh, oglink.com slash 628. And I guess, uh, I guess that concludes this batch for this week. Uh, okay. We, we got um, some more so... happening. <laughs> How many, how many more do we have uh, waiting in the wings, do you think? Uh, we've got uh, uh, at least uh, 12, maybe 13 more, I'd say. So that'll probably be another, uh, another two episodes worth if we do not overexert ourselves, which I am in favor of. Okay, yeah. that sounds good. Okay, well then um, let me wrap this show up um, so I can get out of this freezing basement. So <laughs> that being said, thank you everyone for listening and downloading. Uh, if you want to uh, see all the things we've mentioned here, please visit our website, www.talkgeneration.net or ognetworks.tv. You want to come in and hang out with us in Discord, you can do that, oglink.com slash Discord. You can leave us feedback there. If you want to email us, you can do that as well, otaku.generation at gmail.com. You can also become a patron supporter if you really care. Some people do. Uh, ogilink.com slash Patreon. Okay, I got a fortune here. Another one of the big fortunes. All right. Um, hmm. Your difficult path will be rewarding. Okay. I mean, that's very uh, that's, sort of that's, uh, that's non-specific. But it, it like uses the future tense. And like, you know, this is the giveaway here. You have to use the future tense and make a <laughs> cut in order to be a fortune, right? It's okay. And a, for bonus points, you can do an imperative uh, you know, <laughs> mood saying, you know, you should do this because this will happen in the future. But that's not critical, right? You just need to talk about something that is not like the, the, the state of the universe or, you know, here's a good principle to live your life by. So I... Uh, much to my shock, and I think this is like the second time ever, <laughs> have to admit, this is a fortune. Right. All right. Well, Nando did well. <laughs> Our futures are now assured. Yeah. Uh, as usual, everyone, you know, please stay home, please stay safe, and please stay healthy. And until next week, everyone have a good one. See you then. Bye. <laughs>